Thank you very much, Harvey. Thank you all for staying and playing. And I want to thank the, the SHAPE uh, team for inviting me, particularly Mort Nagavi, who uh, one has to credit uh, passion and science. Uh, I hope to take you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, I'm uh, privileged to be up here with Dan O'Leary. And I'd like to take IMT where it was and move it a little bit further. Is it possible to turn the house lights down a bit? I'm going to continue to roll through. So what is old is really new. And I'm going to present that in a, uh, a little bit of an interesting fashion. But just real quickly, uh, yes, it's pan epidemic. It's not just the United States. It's worldwide. And when we try and prevent events, shouldn't we say heart attacks and strokes? There's 1.2 1 million, 1 million heart attacks, 750,000 strokes. If you ask your patient, what would you rather have, a heart attack or stroke? They'll take a heart attack every time. The strokes are frightening. So I think when we look at hard endpoints, MI is not good enough. It must be heart attack and stroke. Those are real damning issues. What are we going to use? What technology? Who's going to build it? How are we going to pay for it? And how do we get to the patients? Should we go to the retail centers? This is a nice movie showing you the common carotid, the bifurcation, the internal and the external carotid, and a piece of plaque sitting here. So that's the major focus of what we've presented at this point. Now let's move that a little farther. The new technology to be presented here is some of the Panasonic developments. The uh, steps that IMT measurements require today for the practicing clinician are tedious. And they are in very good labs, like Daniel's lab. It is a matter of style. In most labs, it's a matter of irregularity. So how do we de generally do this? Manual review of the loops gated to the diastolic frame, trace the R01s. Uh, there's observer bias. There are sonographer biases. It's a bit difficult. The ASE did put out beautiful guidelines, and we, of course, have been doing IMTs in our echo lab for over 10 years. What would be really nice is to have a real-time automated border detection. Take away some of the variability that the individual sonographer and reader have to deal with. And then how would you display this? Could you do it in real time? Well, the bottom bullet point is, in the future, could we have an automated 3D contrast enhanced volumetric assessment of IMT, which would be IMV, intermedial volume. What would that look like? Well, this is not a, an eye chart. Let me just take you through. These are the steps that one goes through to identify the IMT. If it was to be automated, it would not depend on B mode. It would be a real time. There'd be no ECG gating and you would have simultaneous output. So it could be automated. It can be sped up. As an example of some of the Panasonic non-invasive imaging, this is a picture taken from one of their movies. All right, a small study done showing the clinical results. Now, again, this is difficult for everyone to read, but I want to focus on the mean difference between the reference values. And these are critical. If you know your mean absolute standard deviation between measurements, you can do IMT well. The automated program in 30 patients far exceeded that of established guidelines. So this is very promising at this point. Now, let me move you a little farther down the stream and uh, take you into the future, which is really the present. Contrast ultrasound, what is it? They're small microspheres. Does anyone in here use contrast for cardiac imaging? Anybody? Thank you. Yes. They've been out 10 years, and they've been approved by the FDA for that, and they're reimbursed. Notice what they are, small microspheres. This is a cat capillary. This is a frame going at, uh, uh, image going at 2 million frames a second, done by Nico de Young and Folkert in Rotterdam. So the microspheres of air are tremendous intravascular Tracers. They're about two microns, about the third of the size of a red cell. Nothing stops them. When injected in the arm vein with a half cc, they go everywhere. The rest of the story now is going to be based on these little tiny microspheres. So this is the core lab for us, a machine that is now the size of a handheld object. It's now made in one pound. You can buy an ultrasound machine that does hearts and carotid the size of your fist. 
What do we use it for? This is a stress echo with contrast. You can see the white materials, the contrast, a 3D carotid, a carotid here, and a kidney. This is IMT. This is gene therapy covered, will be talked about. The bubbles take genes to site-specific areas. And fractionated cholesterol. All right, now I'm going to fill in the details on this sort of pulpery. This is an example of a cardiac structure. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. This patient received a half cc of an ultrasound contrast agent, which, as I say, has been approved since 1997. The contrast agent here, the microspheres, are seen in the right ventricle. They pass through the lung in about three to four beats. But what you're going to notice right away is there's contrast seen at the apex of the left ventricle, right there. Okay, the very first sign of this contrast agent, these small microspheres coming through a VSD. This patient had a myocardial infarct, and they're actually coming in diastole from the right ventricle into the left ventricle before they go through the lung. Now, as they go through the lung, you will see the left ventricle completely opacified. Now, you're saying, gee, this is new stuff. No, these are standard criteria used by the American Society of Echo for over nine years. Contrast should be used when you have a poor echo. This is not just a poor echo, folks. What you're seeing here is a pseudoaneurysm with a VSD in a patient who did not know he had this, and he was the father of one of our attendings, and he was having TIAs. So we did his echo, and I used contrast, and I said, not only does he have a VSD, he's got a pseudoaneurysm, and he should have surgery. That's what contrast does for us, and what do we use it for? Every part of the body over these years. Let's take a look at the carotids. This is a beautiful carotid from a patient in Chicago done in 2001. Notice that we are three and a half centimeters deep. So this is a relatively large patient. To go three and a half centimeters before you find the carotid is a big patient. This is the uh, longitudinal axis. Here's the shoulder. The brain is over here. The skin line is here. This is the same patient now after a half cc of intravenous injection of a contrast agent. So it's a half cc in the arm vein. Notice what we identified quickly. Not only is there an ulcer here, but the IMT is very well preserved here. What does that do for us over these years? Well, it helps us identify the IMT. We published in 2004 that the near wall is actually 20% thicker than the far wall. This was borne out by Maylene's autopsy study in 93. So this is a standard IMT. It's a beautiful picture, wonderful posterior wall. You can see the IMT is perfectly normal. Well, that's a great study. But you know what's a better study? is when we use contrast because guess what? It's not a normal study and the patient has atherosclerosis already identified. Can we measure it? Yes. There are commercial systems now that measure with and without contrast, near and far wall. These are all exist in the machines themselves. I want to take you a little farther downstream now. Not only is the contrast beautiful for identifying the lumen and looking at plaques and luminal irregularities, what happens is that there are blood vessels feeding tumors called vasovasorum. And some years ago, one of my patients said, why don't you just tell the world that a plaque is a tumor? Get their attention. Do I have your attention? Yes. All right, this is a well-known image from uh, Lerman's group in Mayo. This is a pig-fed high cholesterol which creates inflammation in the vessel wall of the coronaries. These are micro CT studies. So the high cholesterol in itself is not the problem. It's what it causes is diffuse vessel wall inflammation. Well, when the vessel becomes inflamed, what does it do? Cries out for oxygen, generates VEGF proteins. Having done that, the wall now is preserved because the oxygen from these small, immature, and somewhat non-functional vessels provide more oxygen to the wall. If this pig was treated with 20 of simvastatin, which did not significantly change the LDL cholesterol, it did have a massive effect on the inflammation in the vessel wall. Again, speaking to the pleiotrophic effect of statins. This is a human. 1991. So as I said, what is old now is new. So this is an old study, and the vasovasorum are about 160 years old, well described by pathologists. What you see here in this picture is an autopsy image of a silicon injection, and there's the calcium in the plaque. Notice, though, under silicon injection, all these small vessels are bathing the tumor, or the atherosclerosis in this patient. Now, this was our first experience, <clears throat> and how did we get to this in 2003? Just by turning mechanical index down, or the power of the ultrasound machine, we reduced it. 
What we found in the carotid artery is this white line is actually the vasovasorum seen in the human. This is the plaque. And look inside the plaque. Small channels can be identified by these microspheres, which are typically used for LV opacification. Now, there are several contrast agents that are out and approved and reimbursed by the government. One thing I want to point out, notice the edge here where these microspheres are. Look at the dimensions here. This is a centimeter. You see how close we are to rupturing? What happens when we rupture? Having done this in 2001 and, and shared like more at many of the uh, uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, they said, prove it. Well, the gold standard, as Erling knows, is pathology. We're going to get to that. So this is a fascinating patient of ours who came in, and I was asked to screen him at about 7.30 at night before he had a carotid endarterectomy. He does not have a significant stenosis in his carotid whatsoever. This, though, is a huge plaque in a diabetic smoker, not on a statin having repeated TIAs. Notice that this vessel is not angiogenesis, it's arteriogenesis. This is an artery embedded inside of a plaque that's so well established it needs to have massive blood flow. So this man had a plaque filled with arterial genesis, which you can see pulsating here. Beautiful image, but not stenotic. What did that look like after we cut the plaque out? It looked like every other one. It actually has a core that's necrotic, filled with cholesterol crystals, infiltrative, and here's the lumen. As we dig into this a little bit deeper, what you find out is these plaques are actually living tissue. I thought earlier they were cement. They're not. They're actually viable living tissue. And actually, when I saw these images, I took this down to the pathologist uh, at Rush, and I uh, said, hey, John, I think I saw something no one has seen. And John Donoskis was a mean, nasty Lithuanian, similar to my grandmother, only she was nice. Uh, and he said, fine, son, the only thing you've shown us is your bubbles show you what we've described for over 160 years. He said, all the pathologists know that tumors are fed by blood. This is nothing more than a tumor fed by blood. Well, these are the tumor vessels in here. These are red cells. Now, an interesting thing is, when the red cells rupture, the cholesterol in their shell is real irritating, causes more inflammation, so it's a bad cycle. But what it does, it leaves its iron, and the iron stains. So once the hemoglobin iron is deposited in the plaque, it never goes away, and you can identify this guy has ruptured multiple times. The fascinating thing is, if you stain the CD31, which is a mouse autoantibody to new endothelial blood vessels, these atherosclerotic plaques actually had more blood vessels in their tumors than the mouse tumor, which was used as the control for the humans. Now this is the uh, remarkable study. This stain is for iron. So what we're looking at is the intra-plaque rupture of these red cells leaving their iron deposit inside tumors. This is a study we did looking at, just as you saw, the number of little bubbles floating in plaques. We quantified them as three being arterial genesis, zero, and down here, none. And then we correlated that to the histology that we cut out of people's carotid arteries. And there's, as you might guess, if you see more bubbles, you see more plaques. Now, here's a, a little bit of some fun stuff. This is a patient who's had five carotid surgeries. She's a patient of mine, three on one side, two on the other. You would say, well, where's the angiogenesis here in this plaque? It's not a plaque. That's a graft. But if we go a little bit upstream towards her neck, this is the internal carotid, it's absolutely filled with angiogenesis. So she's still at great risk despite aggressive medical therapy. This is an asymptomatic 75-year-old man who, because of his stenosis, 75% will have carotid endarterectomies. And he had bilateral, but you will notice he also has activity here. This is non-atherosclerotic, non-diabetes patient. It's fascinating. This is from Milan. This is actually Takayasu. So it's simply the unifying factor here is diffuse vessel wall inflammation, not atherosclerosis. So diabetics, atherosclerotic, Takayasu, they're all inflamed. What do they do? They generate VEGF and they grow new vessels and they're very easily do, to identify. This is a most remarkable uh, image from Hans Peter Westcott in Hanover, Germany. Here's the plaque. Negative remodeling. No, this is the plaque. Positive remodeling. So this is actually the tumor in the neck called atherosclerosis using special software which is commercially available called persistence that causes the appearance of the bubbles to stain the tumor. So you can actually quantify the blood flow in the tumor itself 
and treat the patient. Now, does treatment result in reduction in angiogenesis? Treatment results in reduction in inflammation, which results, results in decreased VEGF and reduction in the blood vessels. The blood vessels are simply a messenger. All right, did, did we ever show or can we show regression in a human being like they showed in pigs? Yes, we can. This is a common carotid artery. Notice in a 53-year-old diabetic, there's small plaque already forming. But if you notice, that is not a small plaque. That's the angiogenic vessel, the vasoazorum, over the bifurcation. This patient was treated with statins for eight months, brought back. The same study was done. Now, you'll notice we are angling to find the direct area again. So it takes skill to do this. That's why 3D would be much preferred. But we did find the exact spot. And sure enough, if you notice, there's the angiogenesis. So yes, we were able to treat this patient regress the atherosclerosis and inflammation. And in, in the end, I said to the patient, you know, you look just like the pigs from Mayo Clinic. He didn't think it was funny either, and I haven't seen a lot of them since. Um, can we quantify what you see? Yes, we can. We've started developing software programs. Here's some more. Uh, this was published in China. So what I'm describing to you is not from my lab. It's also from Italy, from China. Simply quantifying the amount of activities in the adventitia in the plaque can be done, and it relates to the amount of angiogenesis in the plaque, which relates to the instability of the plaque itself. Finally, how can we really get at this? Well, we've developed a phantom. We have a beautiful phantom model now that represents the carotid. These are the vasoazorum vessels. We've begun modeling the carotid in 3D, and we have begun using a familial hypercholesterolemic pig to look at atherosclerosis. Now these pigs have atherosclerosis congenitally. The repos pig model, the cholesterol level is around 600. They have very low HDLs and we've decided to scrape their femoral arteries to induce atherosclerosis. And if you'll notice in this remarkable picture, this is a femoral artery with contrast. You can see the contrast filling the lumen, but what you will see now for the first time really is arterial genesis in the vessel wall of an atherosclerotic pig that's nine months old after we scraped him. So we now have, for the first time, the first evidence of an inflammatory disease in the wall leading to atherosclerosis before we see a plaque. What did it really look like? It looked like this. These are the angiogenic vessels within the wall itself. Now, the last thing I'm going to show is, is 2D good enough? No, this is a human with severe atherosclerosis. And notice, it's a very eccentric plaque, aren't they all? How can we get around that? This is a 3D ultrasound mechanical scanner in a human. So as we scan from the base to the head, we can compile that. And this is one of the first 3D real-time contrast-enhanced carotid images. Notice the IMT is here. Notice the vasoazorum here. And we can actually do what we call an IMV, intimate medial volume. Last thing, what are we going to do with the bubbles besides make pretty pictures and diagnoses? We're going to take drugs. So there's a lot of work out there now with site-specific ultrasound-directed drug therapy. That is, we can attach genes and plasmids and drugs to the bubble, pop them at the site we want them, and deliver their agents. What are some of the targets? Well, all these things now have been done, including stem cell delivery are benefited by microbubble delivery. Basically, you just image the organ, turn up the power, break the bubbles. This is the stuff I've done on reporter genes. You can change the way organs make proteins by delivering the genes without viral mediated things using a microbubble to jet it into the parenchymal cells. This is a series of 17 mice where we jacked up the HDL 23% at three weeks based on a single 50-second infusion of APOA-1 on bubbles. Thank you very much.